great pleasure to be here with you today to talk about this exciting subject of internationalization of Roman B and the role of Hong Kong in this process. I'll be using a PowerPoint uh, presentation. On my right screen, there will be an English version. On my left screen will be a French translation. I hope it's translated properly because I have absolutely no understanding of French. Okay, let me start. Because, all right. First one. The story began uh, about 10 years ago. Before 2004, we knew there was a very rapidly developing country called China, but renminbi uh, was and still the currency used, but on this very big main of China onshore market, there are lots of restrictions limiting the flow of renminbi, the currency, out of China. So you can see this slide, it's a kind of big sea or river separating the onshore market from the offshore market. Next one. But uh, something happened in 2004. It was a very limited pilot scheme called personal accounts. It's, it is a, a policy which allowed Hong Kong residents, Hong Kong residents only, to open bank accounts to have a conversion and remittances and savings account. Uh, that was a very limited scale of a pilot which began 10 years ago. Next one. Five years after 2004, another pilot scheme was launched. It's called a settlement, a pilot scheme on the settlement using RMB in trade. And in 2009, when the scheme began, it was a very modest scheme, basically, a number of corporates, very small number of corporates on the mainland in five cities were allowed to use RMB for trade settlement with Hong Kong, Macau, and 10 ASEAN countries. It was a very modest scheme in 2009 when we began. Next one. And two years later, after the scheme was launched, it was made bigger. You can see the bridge, the trade uh, channel bridge has been widened. And by 2011, Basically, all China's external trade to the entire world and current account transactions could be settled in RMB. So you can see this bridge symbolizing the trade channels with very, very, very heavy traffic. But 2011 was also a year of great significance because a couple of other major reforms were also launched in that year. Next one. The first one is direct investment channel. Uh, early in 2011, uh, Beijing uh, introduced a policy which allowed mainland companies, when they go outside of China for merger, acquisitions, investments, they could. They were allowed to use for the first time RMB in those transactions. Next one. And later in the year, FDIs, I mean foreign companies investing in China, prior to that, they can only use dollar, Euro, yen, Hong Kong dollar, you name it, and then convert in RMB when they invested in China. But starting from 2011, foreign investments were allowed to use RMB if they have the funding and direct into the Chinese investments. Meaning what? Meaning they do not, they no longer are required to convert foreign currency into RMB. That would involve a, a conversion cost and also a time lag. And again, also in 2011, we start to see portfolio investments being allowed. The two important aspects of this portfolio investment by overseas investors into China were the investment in the interbank bond markets. Quotas were granted to overseas institutions and central banks, including ourselves, to invest in the in, on the mainland in the bank in the bond markets. And also in 2011, the so-called RMB qualified foreign institute investor quotas were actually launched to allow foreign fund managers and institution investors to invest on the mainland basically stock market. So you can see 2011 was a very significant year in terms of opening up China's uh, capital accounts. Next one. 2014, uh, one thing is added in terms of portfolio investment channel, that is the 
launch, announcement of the launch of scheme of Shanghai and Hong Kong Stock Exchange Connect. That is a scheme, something we will talk about later on by our panelists. But this is an important milestone because it enables Hong Kong and overseas investors to invest on Asia's listed in Shanghai through the Hong Kong platform and vice versa, meaning all mainland investors could invest in shares listed in Hong Kong Stock Exchange through the Shanghai platform. Next one. Now, all in all, 2014, here we are. We got a very, very nicely built and wide bridge, allowing a lot of traffic moving in and out of mainland China. That is a very important um, uh, milestone for China's uh, liberalization of the current account and capital account uh, uh, controls. Next one. Now, uh, with all these bridges being built, open up for traffic, what are the effects? What are the kind of uh, effects that we can observe? Next one. Now, back to 2009, there was a uh, Five years ago, not that long ago, uh, can you back to the slide? In terms of external trade, in terms of foreign direct investment in China, in, in terms of uh, overseas direct investment by Chinese corporates, none of this is basically zero. Zero amount, zero percentage was in renminbi. Uh, basically, the companies involved must use foreign currency in all these uh, transactions. But five years later, you can see um, the ratio of change. Uh, China's ex external trade has been expanding rapidly, but at the same time, you can see that from zero in 2009, around 20, 21% of China's external trade is now settled in renminbi. And you can imagine, for foreign direct investment in China, where the actually ultimate currency to be used is renminbi, the ratio of FDIs uh, into China using renminbi has gone up very, very significantly to 32%. But even for ODI, investing overseas, the ratio has gone from zero five years ago to 18% now. Next one. Now, where does Hong Kong feature in all this process? Next one. Of course, the first one is must be trade, because trade settlement is the original uh, and also the current purposes of the, uh, of the uh, of the scheme. And in terms of trade settled in renminbi through Hong Kong, you can see from this slide is that from very small amount is almost six trillion yuan uh, expected in this year. Uh, up to September, the year on year increases over 73% of renminbi trade settled in Hong Kong compared with the same period last year. Next one. But in terms of liquidity, Hong Kong has the largest liquidity pool in the world, um, at the moment standing around 1.1 trillion yuan. That's the biggest in the whole world. Uh, the latest estimate I've seen of the entire liquidity pool outside of China is around 1.3 to 1.5 trillion yuan. And you can see the bulk of it is actually uh, in Hong Kong. Next one. In terms of uh, renminbi financing, bond issuance, uh, it is called, RMB bond issue in Hong Kong called dim sum bonds. Dim sum is the thing you eat for, 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 for snacks, lunches. So it's called dim sum bond. Um, it's been a hub for the issuance of uh, RMB bonds. And for the first nine months of this year, it's already 164 billion yuan, which is well above the, the amount that, that we recorded last year. Another point I want to highlight here is that this is the large value payments that, that goes through our banking system every day. That's real-time growth settlement system. It does represent, the turnover represent the amount of uh, financial transactions that are taking place every day. And the number you hear, the value actually captures the volume that goes through Hong Kong's banking system. You can see from 2010, it's negligible, it's five, billion yuan a day on average, but the number kept on rising uh, for first half of this year is around 700 billion, and the uh, last month is almost 800 billion yuan a day on average. Next one. 
Now, in terms of international dimension, the global RMB payments, uh, basically, RMB has uh, become uh, from very low position to become the seventh mostly, most used currency in SWIFT. SWIFT is basically international payments. Uh, the latest statistics we have is that for the first half this year, SWIFT payment uh, on average every, one, every month is $7 trillion. And the amount with one leg or more touching Hong Kong is actually 72% of the entire SWIFT payment flows. Next one. Now, I think having uh, given you all these statistics, I want you to have a couple of points to summarize my presentation. First one. We are in a new era. It's a very exciting era in which renminbi is begin to be, beginning to be internationalized. It is internationalized in a number of areas, in trade, trade settlement, a company of trade with trade finance and other kind of investments. Uh, it is important because the use of RMB will actually facilitate, facilitate transactions, activities in all three areas in trade investment and also finance. And therefore, we have to actually take part in this uh, rapidly growing area with tremendous potential. Next one. And in this process, Hong Kong is the global hub for offshore RMB business because we offer a very comprehensive and one-stop RMB financial platform ranging from just basically trade settlement, trade finance, bond issuance, liquidity, and other financial and wealth management products. Next one. The final point, which is important point, is that this is why we're here, because we truly think that in this process of internationalization of RMB, overseas centers, including Paris, which is a very important financial center in Europe, can work with Hong Kong. We can work together to strengthen the links, to develop and capture these enormous RMB business opportunities in both areas. And this morning, I've signed a memorandum of understanding with uh, uh, Banque de France, agreeing with each other that we will collaborate, cooperate further, that we will help the private sector to develop closer financial links between Paris and Hong Kong. The intention is very simple, is to grow the pie, because this is just the beginning of a new era, and there's a lot more work to be done. And in this process, I think central banks can work together and help the private sector, banks and other financial firms, to develop closer ties. There are things that private sector can do. They're very good in competing with each other, I have no doubt. But there are also issues, especially financial infrastructure and regulatory environment, that uh, central banks and authorities can work together to help facilitate the process. I think I'll stop here. I think that's the end of my presentation. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, Norman, for this very enlightening presentation. I will now ask the various panel speakers to come on stage. I will ask Mr. Denis Beau, who is Director General of Operations at Banque de France. Welcome on stage. I will ask Mr. Arnaud de Bresson, who is the Chief Executive of Paris Europlas. I will ask Ms. Anita Fung, who is Group General Manager and Chief Executive Hong Kong for HSBC. Mr. Ramesh Lamna, Co-Head of Global Market, Hong Kong Exchange and Clearing Limited. And Mr. Paul Yang, who is the Head of Greater China and Chief Executive Hong Kong for BNP. So, gentlemen, I leave the stage to you. Well, I think it's a great pleasure again to have a very distinguished panel of speakers. Uh, without further ado, I think I will start uh, to ask each of our panelists to speak uh, for about five minutes. And then we would collect questions from the uh, audience. Uh, please, uh, I think there are slips that have been passed around. Uh, please uh, write down your questions, and uh, I'll collect the questions. 
and I try to allow ample time after the uh, panelists' speeches to, uh, for question and answers. I hope it will be a truly interactive session uh, to follow. Now, may I first turn to Dennis? Dennis, you're from Banque de France. So my question for you is that how do you see whether and so how renminbi would play a bigger role in strengthening trade and financial ties between China and France? Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon to, to, to everyone. Uh, let me start to, to uh, put your question into a perspect, uh, perspective from a French uh, perspective in, in, in uh, mentioning first that uh, Paris has emerged over the last years as a preeminent uh, renminbi uh, center in continental Europe thanks to two drivers I think which are important to, to have in mind. The first one is the development of bilateral trade between China and France. Uh, outside the AU, China is the second destination of French exports of goods and ranks second among uh, exporters of goods to France. And the second driver is the benefits that uh, French and Chinese corporations increasingly recognize to transacting in renminbi, not only to settle trade, which is very important, but also for financing and investment purposes. As a result, uh, as of today, 20% of the Sino-French trades uh, settled in renminbi. You were mentioning uh, SWIFT statistics. Uh, when you look at those uh, statistics from, uh, from, from Paris' perspective, uh, today more than 44% of the payments uh, in value made between France and China and Hong Kong are denominated in uh, renminbi versus 36% uh, in July uh, last year and only 6.5% two years ago. This gives uh, to France, I think, a prominent situation in Europe as far as payments in renminbi are concerned. Uh, even though the, the CNH board market is still dominated by Asian issuers, it is, I think, worth noticing that French insurers, I will not uh, uh, mention them, there are a number of them, are among the most active European issuers in that market. So far, more than 10 billion renminbi have been issued by French corporates in uh, Euroclear France, Euroclear Brussels, and the uh, CMU, the uh, Hong Kong uh, CSD. Uh, besides, Bank, Bank of China issued bonds this summer for a total amount of 2 billion renminbi in Paris, and those bonds are listed on Euronext. And uh, last but not least, uh, renminbi financial services offered out of Paris is, are quite large and include uh, account services or range from account services to bond issuance uh, ones. I will not develop that. I think that bankers, uh, members of that panel uh, will, uh, will develop this. So these market forces uh, should continue to fuel uh, strongly the demand uh, for uh, renminbi cross-border services between France and China uh, going forward and ensure the development of uh, Paris as a uh, significant or important renminbi offshore uh, center uh, against the background of uh, China's further integration within uh, the global economy and China's further progress in the liberalization of its uh, financial system. However, the effects of, uh, of those uh, drivers should be compounded by uh, two uh, additional uh, enablers or catalysts, I would say. The first one is the, the support of public authorities, and, and the second one is the commitment of the French financial community to grow uh, Paris renminbi offshore activities, and I would like just to say a few words about uh, each of them. Uh, regarding the first uh, enabler, the support of uh, uh, public authorities, which... Uh, was heralded by the China-France high-level economic and financial dialogue, uh, which uh, took place uh, in, in Beijing uh, uh, in November 2013, and uh, which was followed up by a second one in Paris in September uh, this year, on the 15th of uh, September. Uh, I would like to underline that it has led to a number of concrete and, I think, important uh, achievements. And uh, I just want to, to mention four of them. The first one is the, the FX swap uh, that was uh, uh, in euro and, and, and renminbi, which was signed, be, uh, signed between the, uh, the ECB on behalf of the central banks of the euro system and the PBOC in October 2013. 
uh, Banque de France has actively supported uh, the uh, discussion and the establishment of such a swap and uh, I think it will uh, provide a, a, a useful and strong uh, backstop uh, liquidity facility in renminbi to banks established in the euro area in case of malfunctioning of the market and should facilitate the development of the range of services they provide in renminbi the second uh, uh, development achievement is the is the quota uh, of uh, 80 billion renminbi uh, which was uh, uh, granted under the RQFI program, you uh, mentioned uh, already, and which was awarded by the PBOC to the French financial institutions. And this uh, allows the French, uh, those French financial institutions to use offshore yuan to invest in the Chinese mainland securities market. Uh, and uh, two, two of these financial institutions, uh, BNP Paribas and uh, the asset manager Carmignac, have been qualified last month by the Chinese authority to apply for an individual quota. The f third achievement is uh, 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 the uh, memorandum of understanding that, uh, that we signed with the PBOC, the Banque de France and the PBOC, uh, to uh, uh, steer and, uh, uh, and uh, uh, follow and uh, favor the development of uh, clearing and settlement arrangements uh, to support the development of the offshore market uh, in Paris for the euro uh, area. Uh, this, uh, this memorandum of understanding was uh, followed up uh, uh, recently in uh, September, on the 15th of September, by the designation of a clearing bank, Bank of China, for, for the Paris offshore MNB market. And the last achievement is the one you mentioned, uh, uh, Chairman, uh, which is the, the memorandum of understanding that you signed this morning with Governor Noyer uh, uh, to uh, uh, develop the cooperation between our two uh, central banks to, uh, to uh, grow renminbi uh, business in uh, uh, our uh, two financial uh, centers, and uh, you explain the rationale uh, uh, for that. Uh, last uh, uh, point uh, for, for, for my remarks uh, 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 regarding the second enabler, uh, enabler, which is the commitment of uh, uh, Paris uh, Financial Center under the aegis of Paris Europlus to uh, develop further its role as a leading renminbi offshore uh, center in Europe. Here again, it has led to a number of concrete uh, uh, developments uh, uh, already uh, beyond the provision of a large array of uh, financial services that I have already singled out. And uh, we'd like just to mention here that uh, three French banks um, uh, applied and have been selected last month by Chinese authorities to become market makers on the uh, euro renminbi currency pair in China. I think it's an important point. And uh, this illustrates the, the individual commitment of the major banks of the French place to promote uh, renminbi liquidity. And uh, collectively, the French banking community is also committed to set up rapidly an RTGS uh, system as a first step toward the development of a comprehensive clearing and settlement infrastructure in renminbi in Paris. Preparatory work is well uh, underway and uh, includes the, the creation of a, of a joint co uh, company. The target is to have the RTGS up and running by the middle of uh, 2015. And this uh, uh, system, uh, payment system aims at uh, supporting the development of an offshore market for the euro area and beyond along the lines of the model the Hong Kong community developed a few years ago to settle offshore payments in renminbi in Hong Kong. So just to conclude uh, my remark, uh, I would like just to stress that the dynamic of uh, internationalization of the renminbi is such that a multilateral approach and cooperation between f offshore financial centers, centers will be beneficial to promote further the use of renminbi by financial institutions and other corporates in offshore centers. And I see the signature today of the MOU between uh, uh, the HKMA and Banque de France, uh, so two central banks of uh, two leading offshore centers in Asia and in Europe, as an important step in that direction, which should facilitate uh, trade and investment between China, Hong Kong, and Paris. Thank you. Okay. For your Thank you, Dennis, for a very comprehensive uh uh, presentation. Well, you talk about this two enablers, 
the public authorities enabler and the private sector uh, commitments. And I'll come to Mr. Brazon later on to call the uh, Europlus role in this. But before that, I will go to Anita first, if you don't mind. Um, I just wonder, there are lots of uh, corporate uh, representatives in the audience, and many of them are CFOs. But what are the key takeaways that uh, corporates in France and Europe would have uh, in terms of their participation or lack of it in RMB businesses? Why would they think about RMB uh, businesses? OK, thanks, uh, Norman. Um, I think for uh, corporates or businesses in France, Surely, um, the uh, incentive or the motive to uh, engage in RMB, uh, it's very different from, I would say, uh, five, seven, eight years ago when we first have the RMB in terms of the exchange rate uh, started to adopt a managed floating uh, system back in uh, 2005. That's when you have the first time appreciation of the RMB from 8.26 to 8.11 or 2% one-time appreciation. And afterwards, up till now, RMB has actually appreciated for well over 30%. But I think where we are now, uh, the currency appreciation benefit is definitely not what we see as corporates or businesses trying to have an engagement in RMB or having an account in RMB is really out of the actual underlying business needs. Now, uh, in, in more particularly, I think for uh, France, uh, corporates uh, in uh, Paris or uh, in France overall, I mean, you have a fundamental reasons to be interested uh, in renminbi because of the fundamental relationships between France uh, and China in trade and investment, uh, both in terms of historically and also getting more and more so. And then also, um, as uh, Denise and also Norman earlier alluded to, France has actually been doing very well in terms of the entire development of the RMB internationalization. If you're looking at your participation in terms of the trade settlement, you rank number one in the, among all the European countries, well over 20%. Uh, and your deposit base has actually grown uh, well. Now you have uh, 20 billion in deposits, you know, grown by 100% compared with 2012, 2013. But more importantly is actually what will give the business benefits to corporates uh, using RMB? I, I try to explain in two dif different dimensions. Number one is um, uh, from a trade perspective, and then number two is uh, from a financing perspective. Number one, from a trade perspective, uh, we've done various survey in Hong Kong in particular since uh, we have taken such a, um, a kind of focus uh, engagement in Renmin, particularly in terms of the trade internationalization. Uh, in uh, the survey that we've done, uh, HSBC, uh, of a lot of clients uh, back in 2013, um, more than 50% of the corporates that we surveyed uh, feel that they will be able to actually save costs by using B in trade settlement. Now, now, the reason is very simple. Because when you think about um, trading with uh, Chinese counterparts, your Chinese counterparts will be more willing to give you a more competitive pricing when you're directly settled in renminbi. Because at least this is the home currency of one of the entity. If you use US dollar, actually US dollar is not the home currency for France, nor the home currency for, for China. Now, the second lay is uh, because the market is actually getting more and more developed, the transaction cost in RMB, I would say, is very liquid. So hence, you're not engaging in more kind of what we call the spread or the transaction cost in FX. In Hong Kong, just the, uh, the offshore market, the daily turnover in FX is well over 30 billion uh, in uh, US dollar of the RMB equivalent. Uh, for both the spot and forward. And there's a very good deep market, and uh, the um, HKMA is also providing liquidity support. So now we have liquidity uh, for uh, RMB, whether it's uh, T plus one or T plus zero, you know, for overnight you know, and one day liquidity, as well as for one week liquidity. Now, the other thing is on financing. If you think about um, corporates trying to raise money 
if you have needs in RMB, definitely you, uh, you, you should think about using RMB to raise money because it's broadened your um, uh, financing sources and you surely should try to use Hong Kong. Uh, we still have the leading RMB dim sum bond platform. Uh, outstanding bond, we have 710 billion outstanding now. And actually, again, French corporates are amongst the most active issuers. Right now, up to today, you have already got 10 billion of uh, RMB dim sum bond issued in Hong Kong out from uh, French corporates. Um, I'm trying to pronounce it correctly. It's a combination of corporates like Air Liquid, yeah, Ostum, yeah, uh, Viola. Oh, Viola, okay. And Renault, Lavage, you know, those I know. Uh, and some of them are actually repeat issuers like Renault. Now, why they're using uh, RMB as finance, why they're using Hong Kong, is because they give you the competitive pricing, and also it can easily do swap into the desired currency. It opened up an entire arena of international investors. And I'm sure the colleagues from uh, Rami, you know, is going to talk about the exchange uh, um, development. Um, the uh, Shanghai Hong Kong Stock Connect, that is also a major move. Now with that, I'm sure it would also allow French corporates wanting to invest in China, and then also in due course, you'll be broadening your perspective into opening up um, Chinese investors if you list in Hong Kong. So I think a lot of reason as to why you should think about using RMB and on a personal basis, try to open a personal RMB account with BNP or with HSBC. Well, thank you, Anita. I think uh, I thought uh, advertisement is not to be encouraged in this kind of session. But I think you, you ra raised a couple of key points because for a French or European company trading with China or investing in China, uh, the use of RMB is, is, I think, is a must because uh, you will get probably more competitive and better pricing if you buy from China and pay in RMB. And if you are investing in China, it doesn't matter if it's manufacturing, production, or distribution, or services, if you can borrow in RMB and your receivables in China will be RMB, you have a perfect match in the currency, both your, your income stream and liability. And you don't have to worry about uh, hedging. Of course, it, it also uh, depends on the cost of financing. And so far, the market in Hong Kong has proved itself to be quite user-friendly. So you have lots of uh, issuers keep on returning to Hong Kong for issuances. All right, uh, then let me turn to uh, Arnu Bresson. Uh, the central bank official just talked about two enablers. So one is, of course, public authorities' work, collaboration, but also private sector's commitment is also very important. Can you, can you say a few words on that? Well, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Governor, for your invitation. And first, I would like to uh, uh, thank uh, very warmly Hong Kong Trading Development Council to have uh, organized this uh, wonderful uh, Hong Kong and Asian Forum here in Paris. Uh, we have been very impressed this morning with uh, the number of participants and uh, Paris Europlace and uh, Paris, uh, the city of Paris, we are more than uh, happy to uh, welcome this, uh, this important forum. We have uh, regular connections with Hong Kong and uh, also with uh, mainland China and uh, we are uh, determined to, to go further and accelerate uh, business opportunities between Paris and uh, and Hong Kong. Um, as, uh, as you know, I would like just to remember you that Paris Europlace is an interesting organization because uh, we are something like the city of London uh, for Paris, but a little bit different because uh, since the creation of our organization, uh, our objective has been to develop a financial center which uh, uh, serves uh, the needs of its clients, so the companies, including SMEs, and the financing of the economy. And that's the reason for which, uh, in such slight difference uh, compared to the city of London, our organization gathers all the market players, not only uh, the banks and financial intermediaries, but also uh, institutional investors and, in the front line, uh, corporates and businesses. 
and I will come back uh, to this point concerning renminbi issues. Uh, just to uh, mention that uh, because of this specific organization, uh, our business model has become a little like a post-crisis business model for um, big emerging financial markets, and we have signed uh, cooperation agreements in 2009 with uh, Dubai and Qatar in 2010 with uh, Shanghai and Moscow and um, in 2011 with uh, NAFMI in Beijing and last year with Morocco and uh, Algeria and uh, I have already mentioned to uh, Minister Tsong that uh, we should be interested to develop a, a, a stronger cooperation with uh, Hong Kong. So coming to your point and uh, I think uh, it will uh, confirm what uh, Anita was saying. Um, first, Paris Europlus, uh, our organization has been uh, mobilized since the beginning, since the first announcements by the Chinese authorities uh, of the internationalization of the renminbi and the first uh, measures which have been taken. And uh, we have um, set up a, a special uh, steering committee with uh, the support of Banque de France to uh, put together all market players, uh, French and Chinese market players, issuers, investors, banks, to uh, work on this issue and to uh, fix a roadmap to develop uh, services and activities in Paris. And our first objective has been to develop trade finance activities, Mr. Governor, like you were saying, it has been the first a, a concrete priority for renminbi developments and to mobilize corporates and what we know what we, we know today because we have uh, made a, a special survey uh, last year concerning uh, the way the corporates the european and the french corporates are using uh, renminbi uh, we can tell today we can tell you today that uh, already more than 50 percent of the french corporates of the cac 40 the major uh, French businesses are already using renminbi in their uh, transactions, commercial transactions, and their payment activities. Uh, that's quite much, not enough. We will go further, but it's already half, which is uh, much bigger than the, in other countries. And what are the main motivations? And it comes to your points. Um, I'm reading the, the results of the survey. First, to improve the hedging of exchange rate volatility for 90% of uh, corporates. Second, to avoid uh, relying on a third party currency, the US dollar, for 80%, to satisfy the demand of partners, of Chinese partners, uh, 60%, to improve the cash management, for 40%, to gain a competitive advantage and uh, uh, against uh, competitors for 20%, and finally, to improve the pricing of products and benefit from uh, better prices uh, with uh, Chinese clients. So it's a sort of confirmation uh, of uh, what you were saying uh, according to this uh, special survey. So these are the main motivations. These are the concrete um, ways the corporates are using uh, renminbi today. And our job as Paris Oplast today is to accelerate the movement, not only in France, but on European level. First, to uh, disseminate, to widen uh, information and understanding about uh, the reasons for which it can be useful for corporates, including SMEs, uh, to use uh, renminbi. Second, to communicate the French and Chinese banks uh, offer in Europe to corporates as well as uh, investors. And finally, uh, to accelerate with support of Banque de France the mobilization of the market players. That's what we are doing as uh, Paris Europlas. Thank you very much. Um, well, next, I would like to turn to Paul. Paul, um, you work for a bank which is active in Hong Kong in the offshore market, but now you're in Paris, uh, where you grew up. Uh, and uh, my question is, how does a bank like your, the one, your, your bank, help uh, customers or clients in France or Europe to expand its China or RMB related business? Well, uh, thank you very much, uh, Norman. Uh, yes, I, I grew up in this place. 
I realized that Arnaud uh, took my allocated time and uh, Anita made it so clear that, uh, you know, I, I don't have much to say. But I think uh, as far as BNP is concerned, um, the way we, we, we know very well our European clients, so, you know, every time you, you explain how the bridge got built, uh, trade, and then, you know, ODI, foreign direct investment, and then later uh, we're now seeing uh, more and more capital flows. I think uh, European, at least my experience dealing with European corporates, is that they are very smart. Every time there is, you know, for instance, a change of regulation like the RMB, uh, etc., usually the Asian, the Chinese especially, will see that as a, as a great opportunity. Uh, usually the corporates in Europe, and especially if they're French, they will say, mm, uh, you know, <laughs> please explain again, uh, because by nature they are educated to be skeptical. So I think we have spent all those years doing a lot of education. First of all, we have to convince our own bankers that it makes sense for the client. And then once all the bankers are, uh, I would say, convinced it makes sense, then we will spend time to, to explain. And I think it has taken a little bit, uh, uh, taken a while before uh, European really uh, got, got to use it. I think we can, when we say European client, we, we make a distinction between the, uh, I would say, large corporate. I think the large corporate, they are highly sophisticated. I mean, uh, Anita mentioned whether it's the Veolia, whether it's the Lafarge, whether it's the Air Liquid. I think all those guys, they have their EMTN program. They know where to issues. They know from time to time which window they, they, they issue. So for them, I mean, say, ability to issue in RMB at a favorable costs it is just a matter, I mean, on what's the best window and when to do it and how, how to diversify. So since they have a lot of investment in China, they can then uh, take this money that they have raised offshore at a very competitive price, a competitive yield, and they can move it onshore where the rates are obviously are much higher. So I think for, for those sophisticated players, the, the ball game is different. They, they, they learn, uh, I would say, almost as fast as banks, and they take full, uh, I would say, opportunity, as, uh, as, you, as you mentioned. But for a lot of the corporates, I would say the mid-cap, et cetera, it will take a lot of time for them to be convinced that this is really a way to go. When you try to tell them, like you say, look, when you negotiate with your supplier in China, when you negotiate with your uh, buyer in China, they will probably think that the U.S. dollar it doesn't make sense because this is a depreciating currency, and that you know they will give you a better discount if you pay in RMB, if you if you denominated your invoice in RMB. But I think you know the the the, the treasurer or the corporate uh, the CFO here, and they will say no, we're not convinced. So you know it takes it takes time. So what we see is that we are quite happy because over the few years, I think as the market developed, now we see real traction. We see that we have more and more traction in Europe where. Uh, I would say uh, beyond the, the CAC 40, we have a lot of clients now ready to open an account and they have opened an account. They hedge, they try to maximize their working capital, so taking the opportunity of, uh, uh, I would say, uh, financing offshore at the cheaper rates than onshore. Uh, they are, uh, I would say, also hedging uh, very well on various products, as, as you mentioned now. In Hong Kong, we have a huge ample liquidity, not only because of the, we have one trillion of deposit, but clearly now, even if you go for the big ticket, I think uh, it's very easy to clear a big FX uh, transaction in Hong Kong. And uh, we have also pushed by the regulator, by the enablers that you mentioned, we have also provided a lot of transparency to the market with a lot of, uh, I would say, whether it's a CNH high bore, whether it is even for ourselves, we have a wholesale corporate grid that's available to all the clients so they can see how much they are charged, uh, what, on the, what cost of fund they are charged, and, and, and you know how much they get if the deposit remain be with us. So I think the market has been tremendously uh, liquid, uh, tremendously more transparent, and it gives also a lot of comfort for the European client and the, and, and the European, uh, I would say the French corporate, to, to get in the, 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 the business and to transact uh, in RMB. So I think this is really a positive development. And of course, I think uh, uh, with the recent development in China, in Hong Kong, what we can do now is also to help a lot of multinational who have a lot of cash trapped in China, that they, that they can now also uh, totally pull the cash in and out. And, and I think as, as China push for this internalization of RMB, 
it is really, uh, I would say, great to see now that we have, uh, and that was uh, what Anita was mentioning as well, we have now almost the same uh, 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 level of rates, and, and the more uh, we, we see this develop, we, the more we can be confident that China will reach, I would say, not f maybe not full convertibility, but uh, I would say at least a, a very uh, a liquid market for RMB. So we are very confident that Hong Kong is developing on, on the right side, and uh, BNP Paribas, we we, we are really, I would say, uh, convinced that uh, it's just going to be uh, even better going forward. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Paul. Um, last but not least, let me turn to Romy Lamba. Um, can you comment on the role of the Hong Kong Stock Exchange in this process of uh, renminbi internationalization? And can you also say a few words on this uh, Hong Kong-Shanghai Stock Connect? Thank you, Norman. Um, I think what we've been talking here today is really about the development of an infrastructure or ecosystem across Hong Kong as an offshore RMB center. This started most significantly around 2009, 2010, as Norman pointed out in his slides. And at that stage, Hong Kong Exchange always said, we're gonna be a big promoter and a big supporter of RMB internationalization but we're probably going to be a late beneficiary in terms of actually um, actively participating in this RMB internationalization. And what I mean by that, a lot of what's been happening is around um, spot transactions, trade finance, the banking system, certificates of deposit, um, dim sum bonds, and so on, uh, bank loans. Um, so sort of business as usual around buy and hold or um, business activities. What we haven't seen a lot of, and we're beginning to see more of, is a product extension or product expansion, sector extension into other asset classes, in particular equities. And so our role uh, as Hong Kong Exchange in developing RMB internationalization is trying to move it beyond um, what has happened so far. And understandably, equity is, is not a fixed principal protected product, so it was not an obvious um, product for RMB appreciation when RMB internationalization first started. What we did in 2011 is we wired our exchange, so to speak. We set up the infrastructure to make it RMB compatible. So we're one of the few exchanges in the world that actually has the capability to trade any product in two currencies, Hong Kong dollars, which is um, our base currency, as well as RMB. And over 95% of all our brokers are also RMB enabled and connected to us. That was a very significant step. Without that, we wouldn't be able to do a number of the things we've done. Mm -hmm. Today, we have about 150 plus products that are RMB denominated, mostly listed dim sum bonds, as well as RMB denominated ETFs using the RQ fee quota. Um, to be able to, rather than rely on a synthetic ETF, they can actually send the RMB to China <coughs> and buy the A shares underlying the equity ETFs uh, in physical form. What we see going forward is two different types of um, expansion. One, as Norman referred to, is actually RMB flows in and out of China. And this is related to the Shanghai Hong Kong Stock Connect. This is going to be um, when it's launched and, and we're ready to go and hopefully we will see a launch uh, imminently, um, a very groundbreaking milestone type of initiative where we're not creating a second pool of liquidity, we're not um, doing, you know, creating an ADR or Hong Kong DR for Chinese shares. What we're actually doing is accepting your orders in Hong Kong and order routing them or sending them to China to the central pool of liquidity to be traded there and vice versa. Chinese investors can place their orders with their broker through the Shanghai Stock Exchange and those orders will be sent into Hong Kong Exchange into our matching engine. But all the settlement uh, for those northbound A-share trading will happen in Hong Kong in our clearinghouse uh, and it'll be on a net basis and investors have to show up in, with RMB. So they'll be tapping into the pool of RMB available in Hong Kong today to trade A shares in RMB. Conversely, Chinese investors will be trading Hong Kong dollar shares. However, they have to pay for them 
in RMB. And all the RMB that the Shanghai Stock Exchange and China Clear Collect will be brought into Hong Kong and converted there. So you're going to have two-way flows of RMB. Uh, initially, there'll be some quotas, but over time, this could create significant churn, if you will, in the volumes of RMB on a daily basis beyond the spot transactions and, and so on. And it's a fairly groundbreaking measure because it's going to open up the Chinese A-share market to pretty much any investor who can trade in Hong Kong, uh, which is pretty much any international investor, any individual investor. And finally, the other thing that we'd like to do is create RMB products, offshore products in new asset classes, particularly in derivatives. Today, we have one RMB US dollar currency future. We uh, expect to ex expand that into additional currency pairings and also interest rate products and credit products. And we're launching on December 1st uh, three commodity products on metals. We own the London Metal Exchange, and we're going to use their benchmark prices. And all of these contracts will be denominated in RMB. So slowly but surely, I think you'll see an expansion of this RMB ecosystem beyond the banking sector, beyond the deposit sector, into incremental asset classes. And when you look at the, some of the leading exchanges in the world today, such as CME, ICE, Life in London, Eurex, um, they're all very active in derivative products. And this is what we see as the next dimension for RMB internationalization, is the creation of RMB-denominated derivative products in Hong Kong. Thank you, Romy. Um, that's a good summary of uh, the role of the Hong Kong Stock Exchange. Now, uh, we are finished with the five uh, panelists' uh, presentations. Now we turn to the question and answer. I've got quite a, quite a large collection of questions. I don't think I have, we have time to cover all of them, so I try my best to uh, uh, group them together if they're similar in nature. Now, the first one I have is this. It's quite macro story. The question is this, uh, given that China is rapidly slowing down, that's the question, right? It's not my uh, judgment. It rapidly slowing down, would this affect the progress of renminbi internationalization and to what extent it affects Hong Kong's role in developing as the hub for global offshore renminbi markets? So slow down in China, but they slow down the process of internationalization. Anyone wanting to come? Anita, give it a try. Okay, thanks, Norman. Um, uh, China slowing down, I think uh, it shouldn't take anybody by surprise. Uh, it's something that is expected uh, from the uh, Chinese um, side uh, because China is trying to go through a structural reform. I think if you uh, try to use three words to describe China in the past 35 years is uh, made in China. And then if you're trying to think about what are the three words you want to describe, the next 35 years is consumed by China. So we, we're probably not there yet. So in order to go through that kind of structural reform, when China were growing like in double digit, uh, critics will say that, oh, these are not genuine underlying growth. It's Basically, government spending, you know, infrastructure, a lot of white elephants, you know, project, etc., and etc. And now China is going through that structural reform. Surely, there is that bit of a global impact. Uh, the world has is undergoing and will still undergoing a lot of uncertainties, and the world has actually slowed down. Uh, if you look at various forecasts, whether IMF, you know, World Bank, you will see actually the world. Overall, the growth has slowed down, you know, by one to two percent at the very least. You know, that's being projected for the next kind of five years. So, I think slowdown is expected. Is actually looking at the underlying elements of the slowdown. If China continue to slow down, but yet is not making progress in a structural reform, uh, then we need to raise uh, some more questions. Uh, but this will not change the direction of China opening up. And when China opening up, they haven't told the world it's going to be a arithmetic progression of opening up 2% every single year. It's not supposed to be an even pace because China is a big country and the entire process of opening up, they've always tried to maintain three main things, stability, controllability, independence. Uh, 
uh, and we will continue to see that. Uh, so, would it impact Hong Kong? Uh, uh, yeah, um, Hong Kong will just need to uh, cope. As Hong Kong, we need to cope with all the challenges that we have facing uh, globally. But that doesn't mean that China uh, slowing down would mean Hong Kong would play a lesser role in China's opening up. And I think China slowing down means that Hong Kong should get the gears up to even try to play a more active role to see how we can actually fit in and be very positive. So uh, Hong Kong's infrastructure, Hong Kong's financial market development continue uh, to be able to support and play a role in China's uh, opening up. And I think if we try to think about the next five years of the major trend in China's opening up, I mean, where Hong Kong can play a role, um, it will be in the continuous opening up and liberalization of the FX. We're seeing the renminbi already having a wider trading brand. We all forgot, actually, initially, uh, renminbi is only having a 0.1% trading band, and now is 2%. Now, 2% is a lot. And uh, we also kind of forget, actually, in terms of capital account convertibility. Now, Norman mentioned about all these bridges, more bridges, and actually wider, so Hong Kong will have a much more important role to play in terms of this opening up of capital flow in both sides, in terms of both in terms of infrastructure and also attracting international investors and players using Hong Kong as a point of contact, as a gateway because of our natural advantage. So Hong Kong should remain even more positive and progressive in coping with these uncertainties. Anyone? Paul? Uh, Yes, thank you, Norman. No, I think I think the question it, it really depends because the the way I see it is that you know uh, if you if you remember the crisis back in 2008, I would say the subprime crisis, and then uh, we we've seen what what happened. Uh, if I if I recollect correctly, everybody continued to trade in U.S. dollar and use the U.S. dollar as a payment, and nobody uh, make a distinct uh, correlation between the strength of an economy and the, uh, and the fact that uh, we 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 use the currency as a, as a settlement. So I think, yes, I agree with Anita. I think uh, the trend is clear for China. As China develops, as China becomes a second economic power, it is important for them to use their currency as a main of payment. I think it is important. And as long as we believe that whether China is slowing down short term, and I think, as Anita mentioned, it is, it, it is good for the world, it is good for China that they re-engineer their business model. And I think as long as we think there is a store of value that uh, the RMB will not be worthless. Uh, I think China will continue to push for the internalization of the currency, and, uh, and I think there is no direct correlation between whether the economy is slowing and uh, people switch to, to, to the currency. I mean, uh, that, that's, that's my view. Okay, thank you. Arno? Yes, just to add one point, structural reforms, yes, uh, in, in China. But I, I think that the, the second aspect, which is uh, very impressive today is the way uh, China is uh, developing uh, very strong uh, growth of uh, capital exports. And uh, everybody has seen uh, last week that for the first time, uh, China has been a net exporter of uh, capital flows. That means that uh, uh, investments uh, from China abroad are uh, accelerating and developing very much. Mm. And I think it will be the second reason for which uh, Remimbi uh, must continue its uh, interna internationalization and that will contribute to this internationalization. Knowing that I agree totally with uh, uh, Hong Kong Stock Exchange, uh, the implementation of the Hong Kong Shanghai Stock Exchange Connect will uh, accelerate these trends. Um, for us, as uh, Paris, as uh, European players, uh, we are more than uh, ready and uh, to, to uh, welcome these uh, Chinese investments abroad. In Europe, in Paris, we have a strong offer in equity markets, in corporate bond markets, as well as uh, government securities, in uh, private equity activity, uh, in asset management activities. There is some uh, uh, representatives of asset managers here uh, to offer mandates to, uh, to Chinese institutional investors. So. Uh, 
we have uh, two messages, two main messages today in China. First is renminbi and the way uh, we contributed. Second, uh, a wider offer to offer to Chinese uh, institutional investors. And we are very impressed by the way uh, Chinese authorities are supporting uh, this movement uh, for uh, Chinese investors to, to go abroad and overseas. Thank you. I, I think I just chip in one point, one final point. I think uh, the question is that true, you're seeing no longer 10, 11 percent growth rate, uh, but you're seeing at the moment talking about seven, seven and a half percent. So that's bad news because China is slowing down from the higher growth rate. But but China is very different from it was what well, it was 10, 15 years ago. In year 2000, many of you may not remember. China's GDP at that then exchange rate was only one trillion US dollars. Last year's over nine trillion dollars. The second largest economy uh, in the world, uh, not using PPP uh, benchmark. But then you use, work out a seven percent real growth plus three percent inflation. Normally is ten percent, ten percent growth rate, out of a nine trillion US dollar economy as the base. If they can maintain it for seven years, it would double in seven years. Now, that's a very big thing because you compare the growth in the rest of the world, uh, you have a fairly weak Europe for the time being. Uh, you have US growth, it's not spectacular, two, two and a half percent. Real, you add one percent inflation, it's three and a half. Although the US economy is 15, 16 trillion US dollars, but the growth rate is much lower. So in that sense, you have to think of proportionality of growth opportunities. Where are they? If you are a corporate searching for business expansion opportunities, where would you go? You look east. There's no doubt about it. And in the process, you have to adapt to the new environment in which renminbi will bring about benefits on both sides. So China is no longer it's just a factory, a manufacturer, where it was 10, 15, 20 years ago. It's also a big consumer market. The market is rapidly growing. If you have a superior product, in France, you better think about expanding your market in China because once you do that, if you succeed, that will bring a lot of benefits. And also China, as Arnold mentioned, is export of capital. If you need to develop investment infrastructure projects and you lack sufficient capital, where do you go apart from your old, uh, or, uh, ordinary sources? I would say look east again because it's, it's a win-win situation because Chinese capital needs investment opportunities outside of mainland China. They cannot just put all the eggs in within mainland China. They need to go elsewhere. And where would we go, right? And Europe is clearly is an a attractive destination. But they have to really uh, work hard, the private sector, as well as the public sector authorities should work together to enable this process to develop. It would lead to a win-win situation. Now, I have my second question. Um, it's slightly provocative. I think this Dennis or somebody will answer. So this question, I don't know who, who asked it. So, uh, Fryers is developing uh, renminbi business, but it seems London is much more competitive. So the question is that will London grab most business of renminbi uh, from Europe because it has a much bigger and deeper financial center? I'll be truthful to the question. You should remain nameless. Don't raise your hand if you have the one asking question. Dennis or Arnold, would you like to uh, care to comment on this question? Oh, I understand the, the question is about the perception of a competition between a number of financial centers uh, in, in Europe. I mean, it's a, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a fact. This being said, I mean, I think uh, Norman mentioned an important aspect of uh, the development of uh, uh, renminbi offshore markets. I mean, it's a growing pie. So I think this is the first element to have uh, in mind. Uh, so I think there is room for a number of players, given the fact that this market is, uh, is, uh, is growing. The second one is uh, when, when you have, I mean, a number of players, they have different uh, strengths, uh, also weaknesses. And uh, as, far, as far as the, the, the Paris Financial Center is concerned, I think that the reason why I think we are confident that uh, the speed at which I mean the market is developing is par uh, in Paris is uh, should uh, should go on and even uh, accelerate. Is that uh, there are a number of assets 
that are available in Paris. And uh, if, I, if I want to, to name a few, I mean, the first one, I, I started with that. I think the, the strength the, and the, the quality and uh, the tightness of the trade relationships with China and France is something very important. The second one, more on the financial side, and uh, what we see in terms of development of services, I mean, we are going from trade to finance and investment. And you, we, you must keep in mind that uh, France has the, 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 the first largest asset management industry in Europe, the second worldwide. And uh, this is one of the reasons why there was an attraction for this QFI a quota. So this is also an asset that uh, uh, leads to uh, be uh, optimistic in, uh, in the development of the market and the role of, of, of Paris. The third one, and I stop there, but uh, just to mention, is uh, uh, for a financial center of any sort to develop, you need to have an efficient infrastructure. I think Hong Kong has shown that uh, this is uh, an element. It's not the only one, but this is an important element. And from that perspective, I think that in, in Paris, we have a long experience and a number of, uh, of uh, pieces of infrastructure on which we can build on to uh, offer to uh, market players a very efficient uh, market infrastructure. That's one of the reasons why we plan to go uh, very shortly to the provision of an RTGS. And what we want to do is to go beyond that and develop a, a, a clearing and settlement infrastructure. So uh, uh, that's uh, just to, to, to express the thing that uh, there are a number of assets, there are other players, but I think that uh, uh, the Paris financial marketplace is well equipped to play a significant uh, a role in the development of the renminbi offshore market. Thank you. Arno, do you want to comment on that? Very question? quickly, because uh, I like very much your provocative question as a representative of Paris Europe. And uh, f first, first, y you have to remember, um, I think that, um, your, your Mr. Tsang was uh, mentioning uh, Mr. Jefferson this, this morning, uh, saying that uh, when you are working in Paris, you always have lessons in terms of history or culture. So may I remind you that um, 20 years ago, when uh, we have created Paris Europlas, uh, the question uh, in Europe uh, was very simple, and I got a visit of uh, London friends and colleagues who told me, but why are you creating a financial center in Paris? There is only one, uh, which is London, with, which is a very international financial center, and uh, nobody is waiting for other financial centers in Europe. And I I made the, the, the following answer. I said that uh, certainly London was a very international and high-ranked uh, financial center in the world, but that uh, possibly one day a single currency could happen in Europe. And second, that uh, some other uh, financial centers would develop and work like uh, on, a, on a common basis with uh, some specificities like Frankfurt, like Paris, like Stockholm or other centers in the Eurozone. And to go back today, what are the two main differences between Paris and London which make that uh, the, the story is not over? Uh, first, um, Paris is in the Eurozone. And um, we have been, uh, we have uh, well noticed that when we are talking with the Chinese authorities, when we are talking about renminbi issues, it, it's not the same way for you to uh, discuss and negotiate with, uh, with Paris as a member of the Eurozone compared to London with the, with the, the Sterling. Uh, I have well noticed that the swap agreement between the European Central Bank and the PBOC is double size of the agreement which has been signed by PBOC with the Bank of England because you have considered PBOC that uh, you, you, we are in the position to discuss between the Eurozone and uh, the Remimbi uh, international currency. So that's not the same story, and nobody knows what will happen in the coming months with uh, the referendum in the uh, in UK, and um, uh, this is a quite uh, important difference to be at the heart of the Eurozone. If you consider 
commercial paper or CDS, uh, Certificates of Deposits of International Banks. International banks are coming here to develop their activities with the European Central Bank because they have to be in the Eurozone to access to this market. And the second, uh, last point very quickly, big difference is that Paris is a business center with the presence of international corporates. That's the reason for which our organizations have put themselves uh, in, on the first rank of our activity. So we are much more developed than London in terms of presence of big corporates. It gives us a stronger position on European level and we have set up a joint committee with the city of London to work together because the city is interesting to work with us because we have more corporates uh, represented and uh, this is the future of uh, your activities and the financial center. We have uh, the, the presence of these big, big businesses. So even if uh, we are a little bit younger than London, uh, my last point is that um, in the world, uh, in the contrary of uh, what uh, the Financial Times was uh, uh, thinking 20 years ago, we have much more financial centers all around the world, emerging, uh, quick emerging financial centers. Hong Kong is one, uh, but you also have financial centers in Shanghai, in Dubai, in Moscow, which are becoming important players. And the objective is not only to consider that this, this is some competition for us, but that we have some cooperation and some win-win stories to develop I think we made this point a little bit before London. I think that's a very, that's a very cogent argument. But I just want to my own comment. I, uh, my view is that I think uh, because we are only in the very early stages of internationalization, room B. So the key issue for all of us here is to to actually develop the infrastructure and to grow the pie. And I don't think uh, there exists too much direct competition between financial centers. And that is precisely why Hong Kong's position is very, very interesting, is that rather than grabbing business and people tell people to go away, and when you talk about renminbi business, we say, let's work together. And the first cooperative forum that we have developed is with London. George Osborne came to Hong Kong, we developed the first uh, collaborative platform with London and Hong Kong, and then followed by Australia, and then late, the latest one being uh, France. And, and, and our view is that, at least for the next 10 years, the most important task for all of us is to develop infrastructure, to develop the, the basic liquidity, the width and the breadth of the renminbi offshore markets. That would lead to win-win uh, uh, outcome for all of us. Uh, and then we don't worry about so-called competition because each of us have our own customer base. Each of us have our own competitive edge and niche. So uh, uh, let's worry about competition much further down the road because Roman B internationalization is only at the beginning. That's my point. Let me do a different question. It's about dim sum bonds, bonds, RMB bonds issued in Hong Kong. The questions are two. Actually, Let's talk about, is there stagnation of the private corporate issuance in Hong Kong dim sum bond markets? And then the second question is, with this Panda bond, Panda bonds are foreign issuers issuing RMB bonds in mainland China, compete with dim sum bonds issued in Hong Kong? So those are two questions. Anyone want to take it up? Anita? Okay. Um we might need to think about uh, changing the name dim sum bond when the dim sum market get bigger and bigger so we might need to develop a main course bond okay <laughs> but uh, uh, i think um, we think about is there a stagnation in terms of some segments of the issuers in the dim sum bond market take a step back uh, there shouldn't be any kind of stagnation in particular segment of issuers in a bond market if that bond market's infrastructure is well developed. Because and whoever wants to issue and tap the market will be depending on the market forces. Issuers will come to borrow in a particular market when the comparative advantages and the business, you know, warrant. Uh, there will be uh, some kind of fashion trend 
because some period of time, there will be some segments of the issues of borrowers uh, will need more financings than the others. So I don't think there is a kind of particular problems in a particular segment of issuers tapping a particular market. It all depends on demand and supply if you do have a good infrastructure. So I think in Hong Kong, we have established a very good fixed income bond market infrastructure for both the issuers uh, banks as financial intermediaries and also for the investors. And renminbi and dim sum is just one of the many types of bonds that we issue. And surely, because we have a good infrastructure in renminbi, we can support the uh, renminbi dim sum bond market. Now, talk about the, the Chinese uh, bond market, the panda bond market. Uh, uh, foreign uh, institutions going to China to issue bonds. Okay. It's developing. I mean, it's developing for good reasons because China is still developing its domestic bond market. It's a big market. is well over 30, 33 trillion renminbi. Now, the dim sum bond market in Hong Kong, the outstanding is only 700 uh, billion. So it's just a fraction of the size of the uh, a China bond market. If you think about the U.S. bond, U.S. market in terms of the quantum is over 10 trillion in terms of the outstanding. The uh, development of the panda market by allowing foreign institutions, foreign corporate to come and tap into the domestic market is a good thing because that will mean more China opening up. So Hong Kong would have a role to play and then in due course, we probably would have to find another term for a bond market that is actually potentially fungible between Hong Kong and China. So I think uh, panda bond market, when it develops, we welcome. Uh, we just, we're just giving uh, borrowers or issuers a bigger choice. Uh, so the opening up and also the relative attractiveness would also depend on the convergence of the interest rate and also the differentials between the onshore and offshore ethics, et cetera, and et cetera. Thank you. And Mr. Paul, you want to comment on this question? Uh, yes, just a, a couple of comments. I, I think that uh, the perception uh, of Panda competing with Dim Sun is not really correct. Neither is the Dim Sun bond going down. So is that something happening on the internalization of renminbi? I don't think you should see it this way. First of all, I think the market has been repricing the dim sum at the, at the reasonable price because before what happened is that uh, an investor was convinced that in addition to the coupon that he's going to make on whether it's on uh, Veolia or on uh, Aliquid, in addition to the coupon of uh, 4% that he's going to take, he's going to also take another 4% of appreciation of, of renminbi. So as the market repriced, I think obviously, um, the expectation of the investor because he sees that you know the it's not a sure win it's not the, uh, so the market will reprice so I think uh, uh, that that's one two I think in Hong Kong the market is very Hong Kong is very specific market it is really a true free market so there is no sort of a heavy regulation I think today if you want to issue a panda bond you probably need to file your application and and, and hope for the best in Hong Kong, it just goes. The market is there. There is a demand of investor willing to put money at uh, at a certain price, and the issuer willing to take the money at a certain price, and the deal is done. So I, I don't think that the, the two will, will will compete directly. But of course, as market converge, as the uh, the whole system uh, get uh, freer and freer, it will be a, convergen a convergence. But but today there is uh, a little bit like what uh, what mentioned by Norman. There is not a direct competition between the two products. They are absolutely complementary. Um, I got another question, which is a simple one. What are the advantages to French companies to have a RMB clearing system in Paris? So we talk about financial market infrastructure having RMB clearing system. You talk about RTGS. Uh, Dennis, want to comment on this question? I guess the the the, the point is that uh, as soon as you develop, I mean, uh, offshore activities and uh, services are provided by financial intermediaries uh, in renminbi. I mean, the, the the clearing and settlement of the uh, of the flows is an important. Uh, uh, function. 
and uh, the quicker, the safer, the cheaper uh, this function is provided, the better. And then I don't want to enter in the relationship between the financial intermediaries and, and, uh, and customers, but it, it might have a bearing on the competitiveness of the services that financial intermediaries can, uh, can provide to their corporates. So with this element of, uh, of background, uh, one of uh, the major development that we have seen in the clearing and settlement pace over the last uh, 15 or 20 years is uh, the move towards really structured, real-time uh, uh, interbank uh, settlement system like RTGSs. There is one in Hong Kong. Uh, I mean, there have been several generations of, uh, of them. Uh, now they have this virtue of settling uh, the, uh, on a real-time basis with liquidity saving features. So uh, my point is to say that uh, this is an important element to ensure safe, very quick, uh, liquidity saving, cheap uh, ways of settling transactions to the benefit of the end customers, I would say. It's a general point, maybe bankers might develop that, but... Uh, just uh, to add one point, uh, we didn't mention uh, the question of the Sino-African uh, uh, activities, trend, uh, commercial transactions and so on. Um, one uh, key issue for clearing facilities here in Paris is to facilitate uh, the uh, settlement of uh, Sino-African uh, commercial transactions uh, because we are on the same uh, time, uh, timing zone than uh, African countries with the support of French banks, which are very well implemented in these countries, knowing that uh, this, uh, uh, this business is uh, growing at a very rapid pace between China and African countries, and that uh, uh, Chinese banks are more than interested to uh, work with us uh, on this issue, both on uh, commercial uh, uh, relationships development uh, with uh, African uh, companies and, uh, and counterparts, and uh, to uh, ensure uh, the clearing facilities uh, through uh, the Paris uh, platform. Thank you. I think uh, we have time for just one last question. Uh, it's a question about uh, can we elaborate on the advantages in time and cost of using renminbi instead of foreign currency? Um, maybe Anita try to use, can you use FDI as example? Whereas under the OPEC, well, under if you use a foreign currency, how do you remit and convert and uh, compare with the use of renminbi now for FDIs? I'll try. Thanks, Norman. Uh, for FDI, uh, in the past, um, you have to use uh, U.S. dollar. For example, um, if you are a French corporate you have a business in China. In the past, you have to apply an FDI quota to allow you to inject capital into China. The way of injection is you get your euro or your dollar, and then you remit your dollar into your uh, Chinese entity, say if it's in Shanghai. Once your Chinese entity receive the US dollar, uh, they will then need to uh, convert in renminbi. So the conversion is local. Now, when you manage it on your group accounting basis, uh, you have a structural ethics exposure, we can say that. Now, then what causes that? So you have a structural ethics exposure in managing your Chinese subsidiary when it's incorporated into your group accounting. Number two, uh, you have a conversion in US dollar into renminbi. Now, if you can use renminbi to do the FDI, as Norman mentioned, since 2012, whatever, you, have, you can allow you to use renminbi uh, as a foreign direct investment. You still need to have a quota, but this is a FDI quota, but you can use the renminbi. So what you do is you inject directly, you remit directly renminbi into your Chinese entity. Once it kind of credited into your Chinese entity, say in Shanghai, that renminbi will stay there. And then you can then use your renminbi capital for deployment 
in using in China, which is also renminbi. So you do not have an FX exposure, and also you don't have a structural FX exposure. Now, at the same time, because you have the capability to raise renminbi funding or financing offshore, say if you use your bond, a long-dated financing in Hong Kong, you raise renminbi in Hong Kong, fixed term, and then you remit the renminbi into your Chinese operation in renminbi. So you do not have an FX mismatch in terms of your currency management. It's probably more effective and hence reduce cost. Thank you, Anita. Did you, I think we have come very close to 4 p.m. It's time to hand over the stage to the next, next session. Laura, my good friend. Okay, thank you very much for the, all our guest speakers for their very valuable insights. Thank you also for doing it right on time. So that's a, that's a very good, a very good habit. Thank you to all for attending this session. And we let's give a big round of applause to our speakers.